Hi, I'm Jim Covington. Today is June 9, 2016. I'd like to welcome you to this week's issue of ISBA State House Review. Uh, we've got seven bills that have passed both chambers. Uh, Timeline-wise, the way this works is if a bill has passed both chambers, the General Assembly then has 30 days to administratively transfer it to the governor, transmit it to the governor, then he's got 60 days to take action on it. He can sign it, he can amendatorily veto where he changes something which would require the General Assembly to accept those changes or the bill is dead, or he can totally veto it. Unlike the federal uh, model, if he does nothing with a bill within 60 days, which rarely happens, uh, then the bill becomes law. At the federal level, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it becomes a pocket veto, if you recall. Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War did that on a couple of big bills. So anyway, these bills have all passed both chambers. And the first one is Senate Bill 3162, which creates the e-business filing fee add-on, uh, which requires uh, circuit court clerks to collect a $9 e-business fee against all civil litigants. It uh, exempts motions for change of venue and appeals from administrative agencies. Um, after uh, January 1, 2022, the law library and the children's waiting room fees will be reduced down a couple of dollars, and after January 1, 2022, uh, the uh, ceiling uh, that a county board may impose uh, filing fees, you know, they've got that a maximum minimum, it reduces down the maximum what a county board can uh, charge by $6. The next bill is a really big bill, and if you do any kind of transactional work, estate planning, health care, any kind of documentation uh, for any kind of fiduciary relationship, uh, you really need to take a look at this bill because it has an immediate effective date. It's, uh, it's not been signed by the governor, but when he does sign it, if he does, it will be take effect that day, and some of the things in this act will be um, uh, conditioned on what some of your documents do. So you really need to take a look at this one. It's House Bill 4648. It's, uh, it, it's entitled the Revised Uniform Fiduciary Access to Digital Assets from 2015. And uh, it provides procedures and requirements for access and control by guardians, ex exec executors, agents, and other fiduciaries of digital assets of persons who are deceased under a legal disability and are subject to the terms of a trust. This is uh, taking the Uniform Law uh, Commission's Model Act on this and making it Illinois-centric. Uh, you can see what this bill is addressing uh, when people pass away or go under a disability. It's so difficult to, uh, and it, there's so many different ways, uh, different rules and regulations by companies themselves about how you can get access to the things that they need to, such as their Facebook account, their bank account, and everything else. The next bill uh, amends the Forcible Entry and Detainer Article, uh, Senate Bill 3166, introduced by Senator John Mulrow of Chicago and represent Blue Lang of Skokie, and it changes a statutory notice of motion for the extension of an order of possession by replacing references to landlord with plaintiff. And by the way, we've tried to hyperlink on the document on your screen uh, to so you can actually take a look at these bills uh, if you would like to. The next bill uh, amends the Supplemental Proceedings Act uh, or statutes in Senate Bill 2845 introduced by Senator Ira Silverstein of Chicago and Representative Lou Lang of Skokie. And it makes four changes to the supplementary proceedings it uh, clarifies that a petition to revive a judgment must be served and an order entered for a judgment to be revived. It requires the amount of the bond to be posted after an entry of order of uh, prejudgment attachment against the property of the debtor who may conceal property or flee the state. It makes taxable as all court costs of all charges relating to the electronic filing of cases and pleadings. And for uh, under current law, a court shall vacate a judgment and dismiss the action when the prevailing party files a release or full satisfaction of judgment. Uh, this provides that the court may do so. And the final thing it does is it eliminates the sheriff's levy sale of corporate stock because um, the proponents believe it is superseded by the Uniform Commercial Code or a, our current Citation Discover Assets statute. The next bill amends the uh, Freedom of Information Act. And uh, basically it does two big things. It provides that a requester who files an action seeking to enforce a binding opinion will have a rebuttable presumption that the public body willfully and intentionally filed to comply with the act if uh, the attorney general issues a binding opinion under section 9.5 
and within 35 days of being served, the public body does not file for administrative review or comply with the uh, binding opinion. This presumption may be rebutted by the public body showing that it's making a good faith effort to comply with the binding opinion, but compliance was simply not possible within the 35 day time frame. And this will apply to uh, binding opinions of the Attorney General requested or issued on or after January 1, 2017. Uh, the second big thing it does, it also allows the court to impose an additional penalty up to $1,000 for each day the violation continues if uh, the public body fails to comply with the court's order after 30 days, uh, the court's order is not appealed or stayed, and the court does not grant the public body additional time to comply with a court order to disclose public records. Those changes will apply to actions filed on or after January 1, 2017. Our final bill creates the um, Snow Removal Service Liability Act, that's Senate Bill 2138, introduced by Senator Chris Naibo of Lombard, Representative Ed Sullivan of Mundelein. It voids as a matter of law, uh, public policy, any indemnity agreements between a service provider of snow removal and a service receiver that attempts to immunize either party for tort liability or requires a defense, legal defense of the other party and it does not apply to contracts with public bodies or utilities, nor to insurance policies, surety bonds, or workers' compensation. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next week.